and I'm delighted to have the opportunity to introduce Lori Dangler, who is pretty well known to everybody, I suspect, but she's Emeritus Professor of Geology at Humboldt State University and an expert in earthquake and tsunami hazards and hazard mitigation. Since retiring from teaching, she continues to provide scientific advice to the Redwood Coast Tsunami Work Group, engage in earthquake and tsunami outreach projects with California Office of Emergency Services, and writes the Not My Fault column that appears in Eureka Times Standards most Sundays. They're really interesting. She receives her bachelor's ma received her bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees in geophysics from the University of California at Berkeley and taught in the HSU geology department from 1978 to 2015. She was a member of the team that developed the U.S. National Tsunami Hazards Program and has participated in six international post-tsunami survey teams. She was recognized as HSU Scholar of the Year in 2008, received California's Alquist member Medal for Earthquake Mitigation Efforts in 2009 and was recognized with the Frank Press Award from the Seismological Society of America for Public Service in 2017. In 2015, she published a ch children's book about a tsunami debris boat that connected cities in Japan and California and has developed a K-12 through curriculum based on the tsunami boat. We're very happy to have her come visit us today again and share her incredible knowledge about earthquakes and tsunamis. Welcome, Laurie, all yours. Thank you very much. Uh, it's always wonderful to be here again. And today I'm going to focus on event, an event that happened 60 years ago. 60 years ago this Wednesday evening, um, a great earthquake occurred in Alaska. And uh, so this is a really good time uh, to talk about what happened then and if we are prepared for a repeat. So I always like to start my presentations with this particular slide to remind you that the most important tsunami alert is actually not from a tsunami warning center. It's the ground shaking beneath your feet. Our greatest tsunami threat here on the North Coast is if we have a great earthquake like what happened in Alaska in 64 right here. And in that case, we are very unlikely to get any kind of official guidance because the earthquake itself will tend to disrupt communications just like it did 60 years ago back in Alaska. So the warning you will get, um, and I will illustrate that in just a few slides from now, will be shaking that feels like it goes on and on and on forever. And you need to be aware of your situation. Are you in a tsunami hazard zone? Uh, if you are in a tsunami hazard zone, that shaking is your alert to get out of the zone by foot um, to uh, go to higher ground uh, or inland out of the zone. And you can always go to the Redwood Coast Tsunami Work Group website and find out if you're in that zone or not. So the shaking starts. You need to protect yourself from the shaking. If you're physically able, drop cover and hold on. Uh, if you're like me and have really bad knees, you just stay put where you are, cover your head and neck with your arm, remember to breathe. And as soon as the ground shaking has diminished enough that you can safely move, uh, then it's the time to grab your grab and go kit and head to uh, a safe area higher ground or inland away from the coast, and then you need to stay there. And you may have to stay there uh, for many, many hours uh, until there's some kind of official notification that it's safe to go back to the coast. All of these things uh, require practice. And during Tsunami Preparedness Week, and then again 
during ShakeOut in October, those are great opportunities to rethink what you will do in an earthquake. So a little bit of background on tsunamis. I know a number of you have heard many of my talks and this might be old hat to you, but it's really important to remind everyone that tsunamis are quite different than the sort of waves that you're accustomed to. So when we go to the beach uh, and we see the surf, we're looking at waves that are driven primarily by wind. Um, and those waves can be very large, far offshore, much larger than tsunamis in the deep ocean, potentially. Uh, when they are at our coast, uh, we tend to see waves that come in every seven to 20 seconds. Um, and they're spaced um, on the order of hundreds of feet apart compared to a tsunami that is caused by deformation of the sea floor. These are much, much longer surges. In fact, they look like the tide coming in. Um, they, they don't, I mean, hence the old term tidal wave that we don't like to use anymore. So, uh, I mean, it, it in the uh, Yurok oral history, they talk about the earth tilting. I mean, that because that's really what a tsunami looks like. And the Yurok experience, many tsunami in their uh, time before folks of European ancestry arrived in our part of California. So don't think a nice curling wave when you think of tsunami. And typically surges irregularly spaced minutes to many minutes to sometimes more than an hour apart. We often say just when you think it's over, another surge arrives. And that unfortunately was the case in 1964. So a lot of people go, well, why is there more than one surge? And I say, well, what happens when you drop a rock into a pond of water? There are a whole series of ripples. But in the case of a tsunami, a tsunami is going to interact with the seafloor and the coastline. And this is an animation that Eric Geist of the USGS put together that shows what happens to just one surge as it interacts with the continental shelf and the coast. And you can see that it's very complex. Uh, the local bathymetry, the shape of the seafloor and the coastline become very, very important. We talk about tsunami characteristics in a number of ways. Uh, one of them has to do with the, the height recorded on the coastline. And the height is actually complex because um, the height could be different in the middle of the run like this illustration shows. Uh, here in the middle, it might be higher. Um, where it ends up on the land, that elevation right here is we call the run-up height. It's not necessarily the highest. Uh, some tsunamis have higher run-ups there or higher elevations in the middle. But this is what tends to be listed in tables of tsunamis, what we call the run-up height. And the distance inland, we call the inundation distance. So typical maximum water heights in a few places in big tsunamis may be in excess of 100 feet. Um, and they may penetrate as far inland as a couple of miles. How do we learn about how high a tsunami was? Well, we actually go out in the field. And here's a photo I took in Indonesia. Um, the photo was actually 2005. And you can see how in this case, 
the tsunami removed all the vegetation. So it becomes very easy to measure what that height is. Sometimes it's more subtle, like here's Jose Barrero when we were in Peru, uh, pointing to a watermark on a building. And here I am uh, in 2005 in Indonesia, pointing to debris that's perched up in a tree. It's not how high the water is that is the problem, it's how fast that water is moving. And tsunami currents are, are really the big issue. Obviously, if the water just rose very slowly, we'd have a problem, but it's not gonna knock over buildings like this building in Onondaga that I'm standing in front of. Um, this was two years after the tsunami. I don't know, it was a year after, a field trip a year after the tsunami. Um, and then uh, over here, we're looking at the uh, currents uh, in uh, Crescent City Harbor in 2011. All the damage in 2011 in Crescent City was done by strong currents. The water levels never got above really the highest tides. It takes time for a tsunami to travel from the source region to other parts of the Pacific. And here's a NOAA travel time map that shows for the location of the epicenter back in 1964, each one of these lines is an hour. So in five hours, it got to Mendocino County. In another 10, it got down to Michoacan in Mexico. You can see that the lines are spaced much more closely together up here in the shallow Bering Sea because the speed of a tsunami only depends on the depth of the water. Um, so when the water is shallow, it moves more slowly. When the water is deep, it moves faster, roughly, a tsunami is traveling at about the speed of a jet airplane, roughly 400, 500 miles per hour. So back in 2011, it took about nine and a half hours for the first surge to go from Japan to the North Coast. And if you happen to be flying on an airplane to Japan from San Francisco, uh, it's going to take you roughly the same amount of time, depending on whether you're flying east or west. That is much slower than the speed of seismic waves, which is one of the reasons we can use seismic waves in our warning centers. Uh, seismic waves travel at the speed of miles per second. There are always many, many surges in a tsunami. And uh, this is an actual tide gauge recording from 2011 in Crescent City's Harbor. And in blue, you can see the predicted water level if the only thing operating were the tides. So every day there are two high tides, Every day there are two low tides due to the positions of the sun and moon that affects uh, our daily tidal pattern. Now superimposed on this is the actual water height from the tide gauge that's located in Crescent Harbor. The first thing you should notice is there's a whole lot more than one wave here. In fact, there are several hundred just here uh, over the first four days. The tsunami, we continued to uh, detect it in Crescent City's Harbor for six days. The first uh, two days, the surges were still too strong for divers to get into the harbor to uh, start dealing with the boats that had sunk and other debris in the harbor. Down here on the bottom shows the tsunami with the tide removed. And generally you see that it's bigger in the first part, but the first surge isn't the biggest. And in fact, there are periods where it gets lower 
and then it gets bigger again and it gets lower and it gets bigger again. Tsunamis are tricky and it's we really can't accurately for, forecast when we're gonna get the largest surge, but we're pretty sure it's not going to be the first or the second. So let's go back to 1964. We had a tsunami warning center. It was called the Honolulu Observatory on the island of Oahu. And it had been established in 1949 after the worst US tsunami disaster, which happened in 1946 from an earthquake in the Aleutians that sent surges south. Uh, in fact, as far south as Antarctica, that particular tsunami did some damage. Uh, but on that lovely April Fool's Day morning of 1946, no one in Hawaii was aware that there had been a great earthquake in Alaska. And uh, 159 people in Hawaii uh, perished. Uh, the result of that was the establishment of the Honolulu Observatory, which was very different from today's tsunami warning centers. They basically only had one real-time piece of information, which was a seismograph. So they had a seismograph that detected seismic waves on Oahu. And when the earthquake happened in 1964, those seismic waves took about five minutes to travel from Alaska to Hawaii and certainly triggered their instrument. Now, at this time, the Tsunami Warning Center didn't operate 24 seven. Uh, it only operated during work days. This was a holiday, Good Friday was a holiday back in 64. And so uh, there weren't personnel uh, in, uh, uh, in the facility that day. But the seismograph was triggered with an alarm system. So if you got amplitudes that were high enough and lasted long enough, an alarm was triggered and duty personnel uh, would then have to get on their bikes and ride back to the observatory and start analyzing what happened. And at that point, they would then call out, they'd send teletypes to other uh, observatories in the Pacific, because you can't get a good estimate of location if you only have one seismograph. Uh, so they would send that information out and request uh, data, analyze it, and then send out, if, if the information suggested a tsunami was on its way, they would send that info out to coastlines that might be affected. What is a successful alert? Well, we need to get people out of the hazard zone before waves arrive. No deaths, no injuries. There's gonna be damage because we can't stop that, but no deaths, no injuries. And this uh, uh, fledgling tsunami warning center was really pretty successful in both 52 and 57 uh, in uh, getting people uh, off of the beaches, out of the low-lying areas in Hawaii, and there were no deaths uh, in those two large tsunamis. Not su so successful back in 1960, uh, when there were about 60 deaths uh, in Hawaii, and far more uh, in Japan from the uh, great Chilean uh, earthquake and tsunami, and of course, many more in Chile near the source. So let me set the stage um, about 5.30 in the evening of Good Friday. The pit's recording was made in Anchorage, Alaska during the great 1964 Alaskan earthquake. This is a notable recording by an, a radio announcer who, during the earthquake, described the observed effects and his reactions thereto. We were going through a hundred, uh, a, uh, hey, boy. That's a good one. Hey, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. 
Man, that's an earthquake. Hey, that's an earthquake for sure. Woo! Boy, oh boy, I'll tell you, this is going to get rain. Doesn't come up very often up there, but I'm going through it right now. Man, everything's moving. You know that stuff all the cameras have come open? And woo wee! It scared the hell out of me, man. Oh, boy, I wish this house could take it. A damn bird. <laughs> Oh man, I'm telling you, I have never lived anything like this before in my life. And it hasn't even shown signs of stopping yet either. Oh, wait. <laughs> the whole place is just taking back and forth like you thought it was over expensive to tell it's going to fall just for a minute. Boy, I'm telling you, that sure scared the hell out of me. If it's still shaking, I'm coming to. What if I have to get outside? Oh, boy. Man, I think that's the worst thing I've ever lived through. I wonder if that's the last one of them. Oh, man. Oh. I'm going to stop it there, but this, this recording, recording was made in. actually goes on for about another uh, two minutes. Uh, the actual length of shaking in Anchorage is about four minutes. Um, so when I say that a Mother Nature is going to make it really clear that this is a long earthquake, this is what I'm talking about. This is This is the kind of earthquake that if we were to have here, would be very clear in your mind that, yeah, uh, I I need to I need to evacuate. Um, this is uh, the December twentieth, twenty twenty two earthquake had about fifteen seconds of fairly strong shaking. Um, this, as I said, goes on uh, for well over over three minutes. But back on that Good Friday uh, on March twenty seventh, sixty four. No one here, no one in California was aware of what was going on uh, in Alaska. This is what the Honolulu Observatory went through. Um, they had no way of communicating with Alaska because all communications were broken. So the earthquake occurred, it was recorded on their seismograph, 7.36 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. I'm gonna use Pacific times throughout. It took eight minutes for the alarm to sound. Part of that was five minutes of the earthquake having to travel from the seismic waves traveling from Alaska to Hawaii. And part of it was collecting enough data for the alert, alar uh, alarm to go off. So at that point, the duty personnel come in, they look at the record and they go, Sheesh, this is going crazy because it's still going back and forth and back and forth. So it takes them uh, about 25 minutes to request seismic data from other observatories. That goes out via teletype and Manila is the first observatory to respond. And then over the next hour, we get responses from Hong Kong, Guam, Japan, Berkeley, and Tucson. Um, at that point, there's enough data to actually plot it out. I used to work in uh, the early days of the Berkeley seismographic station. And we had this big map on the wall with a string and a pen that we would draw arcs to make estimates of where the earthquake was located. An hour and 16 minutes after the earthquake, they're fairly confident that this earthquake was centered uh, off the coast or near Alaska, near, near Seward. Notice that in this process, they get a report from the FAA that nobody knows what's going on in Alaska. This is the first bulletin that was issued uh, 9.02 PM, so roughly an hour and a half after the earthquake actually occurred. 
We don't call them tsunamis in those days, uh, tidal wave or seismic sea wave. This is an exact transcription of that first bulletin. And all it says is a severe earthquake. Don't even really know the magnitude. It would actually take nearly a decade to get a really good estimate of the magnitude of this earthquake. Um, but they certainly didn't have an estimate uh, in these early hours. Didn't know if a tsunami had been generated, but if it was based on that epicenter and the ocean seafloor depth, uh, they were able to estimate what time it would arrive in Hawaii. Notice that nobody else is mentioned in this first bulletin. A half hour later, a second bulletin is issued. And the main difference is we have a few more locations in the Pacific. I've highlight, highlighted the California locations here, San Pedro, La Jolla, Crescent City, uh, San Francisco. All of these are universal time. The Z stands for Zulu. Um, so, uh, the estimated arrival time in Crescent Cid City uh, would have been midnight um, on the 28th. This message doesn't go to the counties and it doesn't go, we didn't have an emergency alert system then. It just goes to the state warning points. So this goes to the California Disaster Office, predecessor of today's Office of Emergency Services, and for reasons I have not been able to figure out, they sit on this message for almost an hour and a half before sending it to the coastal counties. Del Norte County finally gets this bulletin at 11.08 p.m. At this point, people are aware there's been an earthquake. The 11 p.m. news there was a seismologist from Berkeley talking about their, how there had been this big earthquake in Alaska, but there was no kind of official guidance. And so nobody responds uh, until that disaster office uh, message comes in. So this is a numerical model that illustrates with an ext extreme vertical exaggeration, what the situation was in California when that first bulletin arrives. The tsunami has already been traveling for over three hours. And in fact, it's less than an hour away from Crescent City. Um, this also illustrates the complex multiple surges that are part of a tsunami. Uh, elevation extremely exaggerated. So now we're gonna kind of walk through what was happening in Crescent City at this time. And I'm gonna show you four graphs, all with the same axes. So the time down here in Pacific Standard Time, and this arrow is when that civil defense notification comes in little after 11 p.m. In red, we're looking at the actual tide gauge recording in Crescent City Harbor. So a tide gauge had been established in 1933, and you can see how the tide is rising. And in fact, the tide is really high. It's over eight feet. And um, right about the same time we get the uh, notification close to high tide. And Sheriff's County, Del Norte Sheriff's deputies got to work very quickly going door to door uh, and getting most people out of the area. Not everyone, because the first surge arrives before they've had a chance to complete their door to door notification. So again, this is the real recording, uh, the height in meters, roughly multiply by three to get the feet. So uh, this peak, this first surge arrives at about 11.50 p.m. And it is a total water height 
of over 14 feet. Uh, it's considerably above the background tide. And it's actually enough to cause flooding. And this is my reconstruction of the area that was likely flooded by that first surge. I have spent quite a bit of time talking to eyewitnesses, survivors of the 64 tsunami. And most of them said, well, you know, that first surge did almost exactly what happened four years earlier when the Chilean tsunami had caused flooding. And this is an actual photograph taken in 1960 of the flooding in Chile. Probably very silly. I mean, this is in Crescent City due to the Chilean tsunami. So uh, clearly that first surge, and this is happening at night, but it's a clear night and it's a full moon. So people can actually see quite a bit. Um, and that surge comes in and then goes down. Uh, and again, this is well recorded on that tide gauge. People couldn't really notice this low. What they noticed was the water was high and then the water receded. A second surge comes in about a half hour later and it's clearly lower than the first one. Then the water goes out and we have almost an hour where people are not seeing anything unusual. This is the point at which many people return to the coastal area. Some people want to check on their businesses and homes. Other people want to just see what happened because it was exciting. They've just, they've experienced a tsunami less than four years before. And this looks exactly like what they expected. Unfortunately, the tsunami wasn't over. And another surge began, be, be, starts to come in and it comes in very quickly. And a, at about 1 a.m., there's two at 1220, at about 1 a.m., it actually knocks the tide gauge uh, over. Actually, I think this is the recording I wanted to show. So this, this third surge comes in, and there's the tide gauge housing out there at the end of the lumber dock. And it gets knocked over. And from this point on, we have to reconstruct the story from eyewitness accounts because we no longer have the recording. Fortunately, they were able to retrieve what it had recorded. But uh, eyewitnesses, almost all of them described four significant surges. There are probably many more, but they were smaller and later. Uh, we know that the third surge was larger than the first and the second, but we really don't know how high. And then the really large surge arrives. And we have a pretty good idea of how high it is because this sea barrier on the west, the tsunami actually managed to overtop it. The tsunami actually came in from the south, even though Alaska's to the north, it has to do with the, the seafloor shape. The tsunami was funneled in through the harbor area. And we know that it was high enough to actually deposit some debris over this uh, sea barrier. So we're talking about a, a total water height nearly 22 feet high. Here we have a modern animation provided by the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center on what we now think with better information, what it looked like. So the time over here, three hours, four hours, it's traveling down 
the Pacific coast. It's also going to Hawaii, although the tsunami did not produce particularly large or damaging surges in Hawaii. Notice that there's many more than one wave. We've got wave after wave after wave. And in fact, we have energy that bounces off the South American coast, comes back up. And now this image is showing you a map of the peak amplitudes. So they're not very high. The scale over here, we're looking at uh, amplitude in going from a hundredth uh, of a meter down to up to about a meter. The brighter colors up here in Alaska, obviously the tsunami was much bigger. In Shoup Bay, it exceeded 200 feet, uh, one of the elevations on the coastline. Um, and, but you will notice that it is not uniform. It's not spreading out uniformly in all directions. In fact, what I often call the fickle finger of fate is pointed right at Del Norte County. So it's the sea floor shape and then what is happening on the local coastline that produces uh, the much higher amplitudes in um, Crescent City, but really all along the Northern California, uh, Oregon and Washington coast, uh, we have high amplitudes. We're fortunate that we know a lot about what happened in Crescent City due to the work of a remarkable man. Orville Magoon, who worked for the Army Corps of Engineers, was always fascinated with tsunamis. He had observed the 1946 tsunami from a tree in Molokai. Uh, he survived, barely. Um, and even though his job was uh, really coastal engineering, he's responsible for the jetties, uh, the Humboldt Bay jetties. Um, he managed to get permission to go and study uh, the impacts of the tsunami in Crescent City. And uh, a number of years ago, an uh, undergraduate student of mine, Claudia Velasco, translated his map into a beautiful GIS map showing what happened basically to every building and how high the water was. 29 city blocks flooded, 10 deaths within uh, the city limits. Here's a before and after uh, air photos of the harbor area. You can see the incredible amount of erosion uh, that went on uh, in the harbor area. Del Norte and Crescent City were not the only places affected by this tsunami. Uh, in fact, the entire coast of California, and over here I'm showing the amplitudes in feet of a number of locations. Amplitude is the height above the tide at the time. So because the tides were high, the actual water levels uh, are in fact higher. So 15.7 feet amplitude in Crescent City. Total water height when you added the tide in uh, was about 22 feet. Uh, there was a death at the mouth of the Klamath River, one in Bolinas, and a longshoreman working in Long Beach, uh, loading, unloading a ship was killed when uh, a a surge, it wasn't even particularly high, but it caused the chain to suddenly slacken and then snap taut. And unfortunately, this man was standing nearby and just the pressure of that snap uh, was enough to kill him. At least $30 million in damages in 1964 dollars, a lot of damage uh, in uh, San Francisco Bay, uh, in addition to the damage on the North Coast. Oops. After the 64 tsunami, and, and I'm not going into the impacts in, um, in Alaska, 
uh, where there were uh, uh, 120 deaths due to the tsunami, incredible amounts of damage uh, in the coastal areas. Three regional centers were established in Alaska in 1967. One of those was in Palmer. Uh, they were tasked with getting information, uh, tsunami information directly to uh, villages, towns in Alaska. Uh, two of those only lasted for uh, less than two years. The one in Palmer remains today. In 1968, uh, operations of the Honolulu Observatory was moved to Eva Beach. It became the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center. In 1982, Palmer was given the responsibility. This, is, this gets complicated and I'll try to sort it out. Responsibility for issuing alerts to Alaska and the West Coast if the earthquake source was in Alaska or near the West Coast. So we had this weird period of about 15 years where if the earthquake occurred in Japan, the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center would still warn the West Coast. But if the earthquake happened in Alaska, then we get our warning from Palmer. Fortunately, somebody figured out that that didn't make a lot of sense. So in 1996, Palmer became the West Coast Alaska uh, Tsunami Warning Center with the responsibility of any earthquake in the Pacific that might affect the West Coast or Alaska, that's who we listen to. Uh, and in 2013, the name was changed to become the National Tsunami Warning Center. Let me try to sort out where we are today. We have two tsunami warning centers. Outlined in red on this map are the coastlines for which Palmer, the National Tsunami Warning Center in Alaska, they have responsibility. So an earthquake happens anywhere. There was an earthquake just the other day in Papua New Guinea. And Palmer sent out the information to Canada, Alaska, US West Coast. It wasn't going to affect the US East Coast, but they're responsible for the US East Coast as well. That there was no tsunami threat from that particular earthquake. It wasn't large enough and it was centered on land, not beneath the seafloor. Everything in orange here is under the responsibility of the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center. So if I were in Hawaii or Samoa or any of the sort of, I think it's 28 countries that are now part of uh, the Inter-Oceanographic Commission under UNESCO's tsunami agreement, they get their information from the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center. Right now, it, it's still a little confusing because these two tsunami warning centers actually use completely different kind of equipment. Uh, PTWC is Unix based. Uh, the National Tsunami Warning Center is Microsoft based. Um, they have different bosses. Uh, they're not integrated. We're, we're hoping that that is going to change. But whenever there is a major earthquake, typically an earthquake of magnitude seven or larger somewhere in the Pacific, we're going to get both tsunami warning centers sending out information. I want you folks to only pay attention to what comes out from Palmer, from the National Tsunami Warning Center. Sometimes the media gets it confused and they'll say, oh, a tsunami warning's in, a, in effect. Well, it turns out that warning might be in effect for Guam and it was issued by the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center and there's no threat here. So let's think a little bit about how things might be different if this 
earthquake were to occur today, uh, I'm absolutely sure it would not take three hours before we got any kind of a notification. The National Tsunami Warning Center operates now 24 seven, uh, hardened communication systems. Uh, although certainly a repeat of that earthquake is gonna knock out a lot of communications in Alaska, there are many satellite based systems that would still allow uh, us to find out something about what's happening, happening in Alaska. They have access to all kinds of real-time seismic and water level data. They don't have to query Manila and say, hey, go out and read your seismograph. Um, that information is being fed in automatically. We have this remarkable system of about 32 deep ocean instruments that sit on the seafloor that are always monitoring the water height. Those are great because uh, coastal instruments are affected by coastal bathymetry and topography. These instruments in the deep ocean get a much cleaner view of whether a tsunami is generated and what its characteristics are. And by a lot of, of pre-event calculations, we're actually able to forecast what the likely height peak amplitude of a tsunami will be. Uh, this was incredibly accurate in 2011 when uh, the forecast for Crescent City was uh, 2.5 meters and the actual peak recording was 2.47. So uh, we have much better tools now to forecast what the likely height is. We've also done a lot more in terms of assessing the hazard and preparing local communities. So essentially all communities on the US West Coast uh, and also in British Columbia now have tsunami maps. And here's an illustration of the map for Crescent City. Now these maps are worst case events. Uh, and 1964 was not a worst case event. 1964 actually only flooded a little area right in here. All of this yellow area is the worst case for a big Alaska style earthquake located right here. And even then, it's not showing you where the water will go. It's showing you areas that are potentially hazardous. Uh, there's a big factor of safety in here. And if all of the folks at the California Geological Survey have done their work right, the water, the peak inundation from the worst case is not, is not gonna be this far. But if I live in a yellow area, and the ground starts shaking like it did in that tape recording, that's gonna be my signal to grab my grab and go kit, grab my kids and get into the green. We have uh, the Tsunami Ready Program, uh, which is run through the National Weather Service to strengthen the ability of local jurisdictions to receive information about tsunami threats and to push it out. We could have the best tsunami warning center in the world, but if that information got stuck at the California Disaster Office, kind of like it did back in 64, and wasn't pushed out quickly to the communities, it's not really very useful. Uh, lots of exercises for emergency managers to both coordinate within their operational areas and with the state and all kinds of tsunami preparedness and outreach programs. Redwood Coast Tsunami Workgroup, just put RCTWG in your browser and you'll get there. So what do I think would happen 
if 1964 were to happen today. We would get that first bulletin within four minutes of the earthquake. The initial magnitude might not be correct. My guess is it would come out as being a mid eight. Whenever I see a magnitude of mid eight, I go, oh, it could be a lot bigger than that. All of Alaska would immediately be placed into what we call a tsunami warning. And a tsunami warning means that waves are imminent, imminent and capable of causing flooding. And all Alaska communities, just like California, have tsunami hazard maps. So people are should be aware of the areas that are likely to be flooded. California locations would likely put it, be put in what we call a watch. And a watch means that the first arrival is more than three hours away. A repeat of this, the first arrivals in California would be four, four and a half hours. That first bulletin would include the estimated time of arrival at a number of California locations. And it wouldn't just be sent to the state, it would go directly to all the counties so they would get that information. I would actually get it on my phone. Subsequent bulletins would be issued every half hour. The Tsunami Warning Center would be quickly getting information from tide gauges, from these deep ocean sensors, the DART system, and would move California into a warning status, not the whole state. First, it would be the northern, as we get closer to that three hour window. Three hours is considered really the minimum amount of time to be able to do a coordinated evacuation. Um, and so it, a warning might be issued earlier. That's what happened in 2011 um, because it was very clear from all the data uh, that six hours before the arrival, we were looking at a large tsunami here. So at a minimum, we'd be moved into a warning status three hours before the tsunami would hit. As soon as the warning would be issued, uh, the emergency alert system would be activated. So that means there'd be uh, radio, television. Uh, there would also probably be a wireless alert emergency issued to cell phones. Hourly conference calls would be conducted between the state operational areas and the National Tsunami Warning Centers to discuss what information was available. The operational area, which is the county, they're the ones that would order evacuations, not the tsunami warning centers. So evacuations always have to be made uh, at the local, the county level. Even with a perfect tsunami warning center system, there are a lot of challenges. And the biggest challenges actually happen to be you and me, which is getting all of us on the beach to move off the beach and stay away from the coast. And I'm using the illustration here of uh, what happened in January of 2022, I did give an Ollie talk about the Tonga tsunami, uh, where an advisory was issued to get, we weren't expecting a huge tsunami, but certainly strong currents. And there were a number of rescues that had to be made of people who didn't get off the beach, uh, particularly in the San Francisco Bay Area. We have very short memories. Uh, emergency personnel uh, change rapidly. Uh, confusion about tsunamis. Tsunamis are tricky, what they are, what the danger period is. And boy, we live in the 21st century and misinformation and rumors will be rampant. 
Also, the next tsunami is not going to be a repeat of what happened in 64. It will be different. Now this Wednesday, Humboldt, Del Norte and Mendocino County will be conducting a tsunami communications test in order to be better prepared for the same type of tsunami, a tsunami coming from far away, like Alaska, like Japan, like Chile. At about 11 a.m. this Wednesday, the emergency alert system will be activated. And what we do on the North Coast is different than a normal type of EAS alert. You know, the one that just makes a little scrawl atop your TV that says this is a monthly test. Because it turns out those monthly tests take a completely different route than real tests. So what we do, and we've been doing on the North Coast since 2008, we put in the real code as if a real tsunami has actually occurred or is occurring. And that will automatically trigger radio stations and local television stations to, it will interrupt the programming, there'll be a beep, and there will be, uh, on, on the radio, it'll say a tsunami warning has been issued for Del Norte, Humboldt, and Mendocino counties. And then it'll say it was only a test. The same thing happens on television. There'll be a scrawl that will say, a tsunami warning for Del Norte, Humboldt, Mendocino County. Now, if that's all you see, and you're not aware that this is only a test, you might go ah, and get in your car and drive at 80 miles an hour to Neyland, which is, of course, not what you do. You don't get in a car, <laughs> uh, and you certainly don't need to go to Neyland. Um, but... Uh, we really want to make sure that everyone understands that it is only a test and there will be information afterwards. There will be information before that says it's only a test. But uh, this is really where everyone who's listening to me right now, I want you to tell your friends and neighbors, it's only a test. And if you're signed up for emergency notifications through the county system, you will get a message probably earlier. My guess is around nine that morning that will say today, you know, tsunami communications test. And if you get that message, you need to respond, yes, that you got it. Why? Because in a real emergency, this notification system is going to keep trying to get a hold of you until it actually gets a response from you. It won't do that for the test. Um, all you, if you don't have, if you're not signed up for county notifications, all you have to do is write the name of your county, emergency notification into your browser. In Humboldt County, you'll immediately come up with the Humboldt County webpage, and you'll scroll scroll down. It will tell you how to sign up for it. We're not testing WIA this time because the wireless emergency alert system involves numerous private companies to push that out on cell phones. And it's just too complicated to try to do a test of it. In a real warning situation, you will probably get a WIA alert. I know you will get the county alert. If weather permits, Civil Air Patrol planes will fly down the coast with an audible announcement. It's looking right now like Wednesday's weather might not be that good. Uh, most of you will not even see and certainly not hear those planes. They're directed for the coast. So unless you're really right on the beach, you're not likely to see them or right in Humboldt Bay or Crescent Harbor. A handful of sirens will be activated, but those are extremely localized for areas where there are likely to be a fair number of people in an outside area, like the Arcata Marsh. 
There's a siren at the sewage treatment plant that is likely to go off. There's a siren at King Salmon. Uh, there's one on Woodley Island. Uh, there's one at Moonstone Beach. The ones on the Samoa Peninsula, they don't work. Uh, no one on the Samoa Peninsula is likely to hear anything. Keep in mind that sirens are really 1940s, 1950s technology. Um, they're a very inefficient way of notifying people when almost everybody has a cell phone. It's only a test. You don't need to do anything. In the future, we don't have a perfect system. We've got to keep working on it. It looks like NOAA is going to reorganize their tsunami program to finally put both tsunami warning centers, the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center and the National Tsunami Warning Center under the same administrative umbrella and have them use exactly the same software and protocols. Makes sense. That way they can actually back each other up. Today, it's kind of hard because they use, use such different systems. So the idea is to become more like the National Hurricane Center, where you don't have alerts on the West Coast and the East Coast being completely different languages. Uh, there are lots of technology improvements that can uh, improve our ability to both detect the earthquake, rapidly determine earthquake size, and also to detect the tsunami. So in particular, deep ocean sensors, um, cables, uh, communication cables, they can be used as seismographs. So right now on the North Coast, we don't have any ocean bottom instruments. So if we have a big earthquake offshore, we have to wait for the seismic waves to be detected onshore. Um, there are some very exciting opportunities in machine learning and artificial intelligence to do a better job of rapidly interpreting this massive amount of data to estimate whether we're looking at something that is likely to produce a significant tsunami. And we absolutely can't forget understanding how people respond. So the human, the social science research into how people perceive threats, uh, how they take actions to prepare. And it's always drill, baby, drill. We cannot do enough exercises or practices. And if anyone lives in a tsunami hazard zone, please get into the habit of practicing your evacuation drills. So I am happy to take questions um, and discuss this issue further. Uh, none of this is my work alone. I am part of a wonderful group of colleagues, both uh, throughout the Redwood Coast Tsunami Work Group, but also at the USGS, um, California Geological Survey, NOAA, the National Weather Service, uh, and so forth. Lori, um, Kay asked to please repeat the instructions for signing up for the county alert. Thank you for asking that. So if you don't use a computer at all, all you have to do is telephone your county office of emergency services. And you should be able to find that in a phone book. If you use a computer, and I'm assuming everybody on this call today does, use your browser to write the name of your, your, uh, your county. So for my case, it would be Humboldt County Emergency Notification. Put that in your browser, click it, and it will immediately take you to the Humboldt County page. You scroll down and it will say, sign up for emergency notifications. And you just follow the steps. It's, it's very simple. Um, we have a couple of comments. Um, one is, I have a comment about the 64 
uh, earthquake? Yes. Hi, uh, my name's Kathleen, and um, I was actually living in um, outside of Anchorage during the earthquake. Uh, my family, my dad was stationed at Elmendorf Air Force Base. And so um, it's it's really wonderful and enlightening to hear uh, your studies and what was going on or not going on behind the scenes because we had no warning whatsoever and it just happened. And um, it was the most uh, amazing experience um, I've ever lived through. Uh, my family lived, uh, there was no, you know, at the, the base, we lived on the base. So all the housing out there was built during the second world war and it was very sturdy, but um, it was good Friday and it was also Passover. And mm -hmm. so it was, uh, it was 527 on March 27th when it started. And it did last almost four minutes, mm -hmm. the longest four minutes of my life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, it was quite an experience. So I'm really glad that you're bringing this to light so more people can appreciate exactly um, what happens and doesn't happen during a, an earthquake and a tsunami. So anyway, thank you so much. Thank, thank you for your comments because it's, it's interesting to me. I know quite a few people who uh, lived through that and many of them were very young children at the time. Um, I suspect you weren't terribly old at that time. <laughs> and yet that experience is absolutely engraved uh, in their mind. Uh, about 15 years ago, I was teaching a, um, a weekend course on tsunamis that sort of opened to the public. And I would always um, have people introduce themselves and uh, an older woman in the class uh, uh, explain why they were taking it. And she said, well, I was with my husband. We had just been airlifted into a spot uh, to do magnetic studies. Uh, they were newlyweds, so she went along with her husband. And the earthquake happened we didn't know what to do, so we went down to the harbor where my husband was killed by the tsunami and I barely survived. And oh. it was kind of like, wow. I mean, I, I subsequently did, I mean, it was interesting because the native people were very aware that you felt an earthquake and you went to high ground. Her husband, who was a geologist, had no clue that shaking was connected with a tsunami. So here they were high and dry in a safe place and they hiked down, took an hour to get down to the village on the coast uh, where- Do you know which village that was? Was it Valdez? Or? I have it, I have it, it was on Kodiak. Oh, okay. Kodiak Island, but, um, but yeah, it was uh, so, it just illustrates again that what you don't know, even if you're a quote expert, um, can kill you. Whereas had they done nothing at all, they would have been fine. Yeah. Um, and that is uh, often the case, especially with tsunamis. Well, hey, Bradford asked why, are... oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to thank uh, for this wonderful presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you. I think we all do. Kay Bradford asks, why are there not many earthquakes in the Atlantic? Well, it turns out there are quite a few. There was just a fact, the only 5.5 or larger earthquake in the world in the past 24 hours was in, was on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Um, but, uh, the earthquakes are primarily driven by what we call plate tectonics, the motion of the outer part of the earth. And the Atlantic is dominated by the mid-Atlantic ridge. Uh, a, a child can look at the shape of Europe, the US, uh, South America and Africa, 
And it's easy to put them back together because they were all together 300 million years ago. And that rifting started. That rifting process, we have earthquakes like that 5.5 that happened today, um, but they tend to not be huge. Uh, the largest in a spreading center, because it's hot, uh, it doesn't build up as much stress. So the biggest earthquakes we tend to have on ridges are fives to sixes. Uh, the type of motion doesn't generate a tsunami. Um, there is an exception in the Atlantic, two exceptions. One is uh, in the um, Caribbean where you have the Antilles that's a big subduction zone. And they've had huge earthquakes, magnitude eight plus earthquakes, not as frequently as we tend to have in the Pacific, but they happen. And then also in the South Sandwich Islands off of the coast of uh, uh, South America. So uh, basically it's tectonics. Um, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge goes right through Iceland and Iceland is erupting right now. And maybe next fall, I'll give my talk about the Iceland eruptions, so you can learn a lot more about uh, spreading centers. Um, Pat Thomas started saying, when I volunteered for, and then didn't say anything more. Pat, do you have a question? Go ahead. Or comment? I wanted to say something. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was a volunteer with SCOPE for about 10 years, you know, a sheriff citizen on, on patrol. And, and one time when I was on patrol, we got notice that uh, a possible tsunami. So we went down to Clam Beach and it ended up as many people going down to watch the tsunami as people that departed the, the, the uh, beach. So, you know, take these seriously and don't go, go looking to see it. Because if you see it, you might be in it. Yeah. Uh -huh. No, that's that. I'm glad you brought that up. I have a video from the uh, 2011 tsunami of surges coming up uh, the Mad River, and all of these people, um, you know, watching, including people with babies, uh, and these three young men who just barely managed to get out of the surge's way because. It's very deceptive, um, doesn't look very big until suddenly it's way too big. Sadly, uh, one of the only, there were only two deaths uh, from the Japan tsunami outside of Japan. And one of them was at the mouth of the Klamath River. And it was exactly the same scenario. Three young men, strong, healthy, went down to the mouth of the river even though they've been told, I mean, people said, no, don't go there. Um, went down to the mouth and wanted to take photos and they expected the surges to come directly from the West. Well, the water snuck around behind them and pulled all three of them into the water. Two were able to get out. The third's body was found three weeks later near Astoria in Oregon, uh, which tells you that he was pulled so far out because a tsunami is a really long wavelength, so far offshore that he was caught not in the onshore currents because the folks in Astoria, when they found this body and the parents of this young man said, could you check to see if it's maybe our son? They said, no way. There's no way you, you could get it from the Klamath to Astoria. Well, if you pull something far enough offshore and get it into the predominant winds, yes, you can. Wow. Um, Alani asked, or asked you to please comment on Cascadia subduction warning times and status of preparations and what kind of tsunamis we might expect as a result. Okay, for those of you who are not familiar with the term Cascadia subduction zone, we have a very similar fault system that extends from Cape Mendocino up to Vancouver Island, Canada. 
as the Aleutian Arc. It's a subduction zone where the, the plates are colliding and one is being pulled under the other. Our Cascadia subduction zone is not nearly as big. It's only about 700 miles long, uh, but we have geologic evidence, oral history evidence, and evidence, written history from Japan, that it has produced earthquakes, perhaps not quite as big as Alaska. That was a 9.2, maybe more like a nine, maybe a 9.1, maybe an 8.8, .8, when that entire subduction zone ruptures here. So we're talking about an earthquake that is going to shake very similar to what you listened on that recording and what that wonderful eyewitness account told you. Something is gonna be more than a minute. It won't necessarily be super strong. I mean, that's the one weird thing about subduction zones. Some are not locked as tightly. They actually produce gentler shaking. Um, we can't guarantee it's going to be super strong shaking. It might, uh, but it will last for minutes. And even gentle shaking that lasts for minutes is your indication that, you know, you need to evacuate. You don't need to evacuate. 99% of you do not need to evacuate because you do not live in a tsunami zone. Uh, so here's really important to understand where you live, where the threat is. Go to the Redwood Coast Tsunami Work Group page. You can click on you know, know your zone um, and put in your address and it'll show you exactly where you are relative to the tsunami threat, which again is, that is for a Cascadia, our biggest threat. Not for an asteroid, that could be bigger, but asteroids, we don't worry about. Um, don't look up, right? <laughs> uh, so what, would likely happen in a Cascadia earthquake, we're gonna feel the shaking. If the rupture started up in Washington or Oregon, we might get an earthquake early warning alert uh, on your phone. Some people got those alerts back uh, on December 20th, 2022. Uh, some people got the alert as they were feeling the earthquake. But if the epicenter is far away from you, and it's possible that it could begin up in Washington state, we could have 30 seconds, 40 seconds notification on our phone. I don't think that's gonna happen. I think it's gonna start closer to here. Um, probably the first thing you're gonna notice is the ground shaking and it's gonna shake and it's gonna shake and it's gonna shake. If you're in, a safe area, which most of you are, you're gonna protect yourself during the shaking, drop cover and hold or just stay put. And when the shaking is over, you're going to take a deep breath. You're going to check to make sure you don't smell any gas leaks. Um, hopefully you've taken some action to uh, keep your, to, to reduce hazards in your home. Um, Bob Pate, who experienced that earthquake in Alaska, he had lots of non-structural damage, but no damage at all to his house. It was perfectly fine. And the majority of houses in Anchorage that experienced this very, very strong ground shaking had no structural damage. Uh, big problem is the stuff that might come falling down on top of you. And that's something in your control uh, to reduce. At that point, communications are probably out. Your power is probably out. And if you are in a tsunami zone, you have grabbed your grab and go kit, you've headed to safe area, you've informed uh, family and friends of what your plan is so they kind of know what you're doing. I am hoping that there will be some radio stations that will come back on air. I know KMUD has done a great job of really hardening their station. So you wanna sort of 
have a portable ra radio and and kind of surf surf it um hopefully within a half an hour some stations are back on the air providing some information but here is really where community becomes important and we call them isolated islands of humanity because every river is going to cut you off every landslide is going to cut you off and here's where your neighborhood is going to sustain you for days and it could even be for weeks um so at that point um you're alive and how comfortable you are is going to really depend on the preparedness actions you take now so that you have enough food, you have enough water, you have enough medications, um, and so forth. So to help you out on Thursday, the 60 year anniversary of the tsunami hitting Crescent City, we are releasing a brand new copy, a print copy of Living on Shaky Ground. The electronic copy came out last December. There'll be print copies available I hope in many places, libraries, the weather service, um, office of emergency services. And you can also send me an email to camomay at humboldt.edu and we will send you a copy. Thank you, Laurie. And then we have another question. Um, Sandra asks, if we get a tsunami from an earthquake off the Ferndale coast, could it be 100 feet or more like they had in Alaska during the 64 earthquake? If so, a far wider area than the tsunami warning area will be easily overrun. And if it can run up rivers, adding that, uh, how okay. do you, how, ex what do you worry about rivers? Ex excellent questions. I, as I said, I've been on six international post-tsunami field surveys. I've been in Indonesia. I've been in Papua New Guinea. I've been in Japan. I have walked, I've, you know, where we actually measure how high the water height is. And I've developed a pretty darn good sense of where we see really high water elevations. I also work closely with paleo seismologists who can take cores and actually look at evidence of past tsunamis. The Humboldt County coast is actually not nearly as susceptible to large tsunamis as other parts of the West Coast. We have zero evidence that a tsunami has ever overtopped the Samoa Peninsula, the, the central part of, well, actually any part of the Samoa Peninsula. Probably the southern part could be topped over, but it's been so degraded by human activity, we can't really study it. But from the town of Samoa, all the way up through the Mad River Slough area, Mad River Slough is a perfect area to core, to see if there, if a tsunami had ever made it over those dunes, it would have deposited sand in the Mad River Slough. There is zero evidence that a tsunami has ever done that in the past 3000 years. The ages of the sands on the high dunes, they're weathered. You can actually scoop a handful of sand from a high dune, go down to the beach, dump it next to it, and you can see that that high dune sand is yellowed. We just, all of the tsunami modeling based on the topography of the seafloor, everything supports that we've never seen a tsunami on the Humboldt, this part of the coast that has been in excess of 40 feet. Now, our planning is higher than that. When we see those really large values, like the 220 feet at Shoot Bay in Valdez, that was because of a landslide in a very narrow bay. Uh, the largest tsunami we've ever recorded in modern times uh, is also in Alaska, in a very narrow fjord where a landslide hit the head of the, of the fjord and a water surge 1,700 feet 
1700 feet tsunamis are not possible from earthquake sources. You need very specialized uh, topography in order to produce those really, really high numbers. So I have, am completely not worried about seeing those super high tsunami heights on, I mean, a 40 foot tsunami is a very big tsunami and it's gonna cause a lot of damage. Um, but it's also interesting that when you listen to the, uh, unfortunately we don't have a lot of WIAT oral history. Um, they do talk about the uh, Humboldt Bay being created in a single day by an earthquake, which it was actually created multiple times in single days. Every time we have one of these big earthquakes, we think the bay actually drops down. Um, we have records of that, not tsunami, but we can actually see how the surface of the bay has dropped down. Um, but from every piece of evidence, this is just our coastline, Ferndale, so, so forth, uh, is not where you're going to see a hundred plus foot tsunami surges, unless it's an asteroid. And then you can produce a tsunami as big as you like. <laughs> uh, Kit and Rebecca uh, indicated that they can report what happened in San Diego Harbor in 64. Uh, right. Actually, actually, it's just Kit Man, and I'm sorry about my blurred screen there. Um, I was a 10-year-old, and we lived right on the bay in San Diego Harbor. And I can report that there, um, the water level didn't really rise all that much. But uh, the bay became a ferocious river. And uh, I lived, if you know San Diego, I lived on the beach right across from uh, the tip of Shelter Island. And the water came into the harbor, swept boats off of their docks, and it was the outflow that uh, did most of the damage. Um, we're right across from the Harbor Master uh, dock and we watched the harbor master's dock with the two fire boats and the police boat the entire dock was torn away and and sent out to sea so it it's not always something that comes up it's it, you know this surge um uh was that was the uh thing that impacted san diego in 1964. thank you for that description, because a very similar thing happened in San Diego Harbor in May of 1960. Uh, it, there were quite a bit, quite a bit of damage in San Diego's harbor as a result of the Chilean tsunami. Um, but uh, similar things happened in 1964 in, uh, um, in Crescent City, that uh, it wasn't, the water coming in actually came in fairly slowly. Uh, people talked about the water rising at the rate of about a foot a minute. Um, I've got lots of eyewitness accounts from, uh, you know, people who were in stores or in, in buildings and how, you know, they kept going higher and higher. Um, it was the outflow that was much higher velocity. And when you look at how structures were displaced, uh, most of them are, were displaced during the outflow because what happened in Crescent City's harbor, the incoming flow was, was fairly uniform, spread out over the entire harbor area. The outflow was channelized into lower areas. And for that particular tsunami, the water, the, the speeds were actually faster coming out. And so most of the structures that were displaced were actually displaced in the outgrowing uh, limb. And the worst, the, the most deaths occurred, uh, a, a boat, a, a group of people, I think there were seven in the boat, they were 
um, in the citizen's dock area and it with the water each surge was getting higher and higher and they finally decided in a lull at the high at the high flow when the water was very calm they all got in a boat and they headed up elk river and got fairly far up elk river on that really high flow and then it crested and turned and they weren't able to get out and they were caught in this incredibly strong outflow. And two of them managed to bail to get out, but five of them were caught in the debris at the overpass uh, where the road went over Elk Creek and unfortunately died. That was the largest single loss of life in half of the casualties in Crescent City in 64. And again, it was that incredible down, uh, that surge going out. Really complicated uh, surges. I suspect one of the biggest problems in Humboldt County, in Humboldt Bay, what's going to happen is that we're going to have water flowing in both through the mouth and probably getting all the way over the south spit. It's going to kind of fill up you know, it may raise the bay 10, 15, 20 feet. There's going to be a lot of debris. We know that happened in 64. There was a lot of logs that ended up in Humboldt Bay. No damage to structures, but, and then when the outflow, you're going to get these incredible uh, currents, debris filled currents, and you're definitely not going to be want to, want to be near the bay. Richard Johnson asks, can you discuss the wave that occurred in Latuya, Latuya, Latuya Bay? Bay, <laughs> Bay was, was actually what I was talking about. Uh, the one that was 1,800 feet tall? Yeah. 1,700 okay. feet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Latuya Bay has bears absolutely no resemblance to anything that's going to happen here. So when you have a very narrow fjord, which is what Latuya Bay is, very deep, big landslide at the head is, I call it dumping the baby in the bathtub. So you take your baby and you aim them right at the edge. Don't do this at home. Uh, at the edge, of, you, you can really get a big slosh if you aim something in the tub. And that's what happened at Latuya Bay. And it hasn't only happened once. Uh, we have three recorded tsunamis that were higher than 500 feet in Latuya Bay. And that's just in written historic times. So uh, it's fascinating. You can still see the scar. If you Google Earth Latuya Bay, you can still see the difference in the uh, old growth spruce uh, that were the area that was stripped from the areas that uh, were not. Um, but, but that bears absolutely no, it, it's not pertinent to our tsunami hazard here. I, I had a question. Um, my name is Jeff and I live in Trinidad and you mentioned islands of places that would be cut off. And I would assume in a large tsunami, even though I'm above the tsunami zone, that Trinidad would be cut off by low lying roads on both the North and the South. Is there any research about how bad that could be or how long it would take to restore some sort of a way of, of arriving in the town? In other words, how long would you need to prepare to be on your own up here? Thank you. Thank you for your question. And this, a repeat of 64, a tsunami coming far away is not gonna cut us off that way. So we're gonna get this problem when we have the 64 earthquake happening here, namely the Cascadia earthquake. And uh, it's not just the tsunami that's gonna cause damage. The ground shaking is probably going to cause more damage than the tsunami in Humboldt County. We're going to be experiencing very strong ground shaking and our infrastructure will be out. Our homes for the most part, will be fine. Um, but uh, 
we're going to find massive failures in roads, massive failures in bridges. And uh, there's actually a project in the county, this isolated islands of humanity. It was a project that was done about two decades ago, but we're reviving it uh, to relook at realistically um, what would be the times. And it also needs to really be incorporated into the national response plans so that uh, we kind of identify areas so that um, the folks outside of the area can actually come and you know, target those areas first. Uh, the, the rule of thumb that I give is two weeks at a minimum. Um, and if you are in a more remote area, uh, I give yourself at least a month. Thank you. Being on a CERT team here in Trinidad that we just formed, it, yeah. it's, it's kind of informing our thinking about how long would we have to be available to help local people get through that period. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I mean, it's... it's what you have to do is look at the worst, worst case. And then if if help comes in earlier, that's great. Um, we really don't know, partly because the impacts um, can be all over the place in terms of what the actual event is. So we know we have a number of significant secondary faults in Humboldt County. One of them is called the Trinidad Fault. And it runs right, I mean, basically in Humboldt County, when you're driving on the coast, if you're going from low to high, there's a fault there. So when you're driving from Arcata to Trinidad, and you cross the Little River, and you start going up, you're crossing the Trinidad Fault. There's also a fault that sits under the airport. There's the little salmon fault that runs uh, along kind of by CR out through the mouth uh, of Humboldt Bay. What we don't know, we think they're all related to the subduction zone. We think the little salmon probably ruptures almost every time along with the main fault. But we really don't know about the Trinidad fault and the Mad River fault zone faults what they're going to do because if they they might only rupture once every three or four Cascadia earthquakes your situation in Trinidad is going to be very different if the Trinidad fault ruptures or the Blue Lake fault ruptures and you're in Blue Lake so the level of damage and disruption could go from very little to really extreme. And so you need to really plan. I'm wonderful that you're on a CERT team. Um, you have to, uh, to, to really look at, we're gonna be on our own for a month. And how are we gonna deal with being on our own for a month? Heck, somebody shows up in six days, great. Final question, I think, from Kay. Can you address the effects of landslides in our gulches here in Humboldt? Well, landslides are always a problem. Um, as you all know that we don't need earthquakes or tsunamis to cause landslides. And right now we're dealing with a lot of them. A spectacular slide right now uh, on the Southern Humboldt coast, the Fleener Creek slide. Um, High rainfall, unstable geology, ground shaking means all scales of landslides. And it doesn't take a really large one to cut you off. Um, can't get up Neyland Road right now. Uh, maybe they've opened it up by now. But uh, all of those things, and here's where CERT teams uh, can really help because, you know, there may be people that have power equipment in your isolated island of humanity. Um, it's, 
it's easy enough to sort of identify places where you're likely to be cut off. Uh, but uh, always assume that the land is gonna go. If you're driving at night after an earthquake, you need to be really careful. Uh, go really slowly. As you approach every bridge abutment, you can get differential settling. So there might be a foot jump between the road and the bridge. Uh, you can have slumps off the sides. Uh, so it's definitely a fact of life in Humboldt County. Laura, you've been wonderful. You've got lots of thank yous in the meeting chat and I'm sure from everybody because they're still here. <laughs> and we've got a long time. I mean, we've got an hour and 45 minutes. You have endurance, Lori. <laughs> I'm really impressed. <laughs> well, I, I just love it that so many of you are interested and have shown up. And uh, because, I mean, it's fascinating stories, but you are going, it'll be on your shoulders how well we get through the next event, not the government shoulders. You're the ones, how we do here. And plus you're the ones that can convince the government that this is an important subject to be aware of. The problem with earthquakes and tsunamis is that they're relatively infrequent. And of course we have so many other things on our plate all the time that it isn't really until the ground starts shaking that we kind of go, oh, well, yeah, earthquakes are my number one priority. And by then All it's of a too sudden, late. Yeah. <laughs> well, I really thank you. And, and I have already asked Lori to come and speak in the fall on Iceland. So you can forecast that that will be likely to happen sometime in the fall when she picks a date. Um, so we're always happy to have you back, and I want to thank you all and welcome you back to April Fool's Day when we're going to be talking about public banking, which is an interesting topic for April Fool's because it's really hard to establish them. David Cobb, who is former formerly a candidate for the Green Party of President and also uh, responsible for co-founding uh, Cooperation Humble now works with one of the tribes, the Wiat tribe, um, and they're doing great work. He's a dynamo. He lives locally now and has been incredibly creative politically and socially and, um, and, and from an ideological point of view and, and economic alternatives to how we currently operate. So um, would love to have you come back. In equal numbers, although I doubt it, but you know, why not next Monday for, for April Fool's Day on public banking. Look forward to seeing you. Have a great day. And it will quit raining one of these days. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> We've had lots of it. Take care, everybody. Thanks for coming. And thank you, Lori. <laughs>